Hi, I'm Dan Smith. I'm the faculty of School of Public Policy and Administration. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator for the first uh, plenary. Um, just a brief introduction. I mean, it's really this simple. The idea here uh, for the first plenary is uh, you need policies to help people, and to do policies, you need a budget. So, and uh, so we're going to talk about budget priorities that can lead to policies that could help the revitalizing the middle class. Um, I'll briefly introduce the speakers in a second. Um, each one will have 10 minutes. Um, it's a hard stop at 10 minutes, and if you go over, I will do the most disruptive thing I can, which is to FaceTime my three-year-old and have her sing Baby Shark. <laughs> so um, so um, the topics are um, my colleague Leland Ware of the University of Delaware will talk about education. Uh, Heather Geetha Taylor of the University of Kansas will talk about employment. Vanessa Fry from Boise State University will talk about pay for success models. And finally, Stephanie Hoops will talk about measuring financial stability. She's with the United Way Alice Project, and she has a co-author, Dan Treglia, who's also here. Um, so um, after the presentations, we'll have a discussant, Phil Joyce from the University of Maryland. And if there's time, we'll do some Q&A. And then I'll talk about the transition to what we'll do after that. Uh, but I think we might as well just get started. Uh, Leland, please. OK. Uh, first slide, please. Leland Ware, University of Delaware. Uh, oh, uh, his slide's there, but not down here. <laughs> <laughs> well, good, after good morning, yeah. everybody. I'm going to talk about the training needed to uh, prepare uh, the middle class. I'm supposed to have a slide down here, but I'll... There we go. Oh, good, good, good. Globalization and deindustrialization. Now it's not there. All right. Well, it's, it's more important that Leland sees it. All right. It's, oh, now it's both. All right, all right. Good. We're in sync. All right. All right. All right. All right. Let's get started here. Uh, globalization and deindustrialization have transformed the domestic labor markets from manufacturing to increasingly technical and service occupations. So my topic is training needed to, uh, uh, for 21st century jobs. And the bottom line is that a, a student can no longer graduate from high school, get a job at a, a local factory, and earn a middle class income. A higher level of preparation uh, and training and preparation will be needed. Uh, now let me just remind, remind everybody about the middle class. Before World War II, there was no middle class. There was just a working class and a business class. And with the advent of the war and the uh, uh, factories and, and when the war effort created many new jobs. So uh, that at the end of the war, uh, all males at least were either working or in the military. So. The middle class that we think of as we knew, know it emerged then. And now, uh, the middle class was mainly industrial uh, workers or individuals working in middle blue collar jobs, such as mechanics, plumbers, bus drivers, and the like, uh, kind of blue collar. But these were unionized jobs that paid well. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the suburbs as we know them were being constructed with the help of the VA and FHA insured mortgages. Uh, so uh, there were just many jobs constructing houses, uh, building highways, manufacturing all kinds of goods. Uh, and, that, uh, and so people were working, it was prosperous times. The jobs paid well. They had good benefit packages. America's moved from central city neighborhoods to single family detached homes in suburban communities. Uh, so uh, the labor market peaked uh, in 1979 with 19.4 million jobs. But starting in 1980, there was a gradual decline so that by uh, 2010, there were only 11.5 million jobs in manufacturing. However, uh, contrary to the notion that somehow all the jobs went to China and Mexico, uh, what really happened was the, the telephone in your pocket and the computer in your pocket, 
so that 85% of the job losses are attributable to technological advances rather than offshoring. So the middle class has been negatively impacted, uh, and particularly by the uh, 2008 uh, recession. So middle class incomes fell from 55% of the population in 2000 uh, to 51% in 2014. Nationally, the median income of middle class households declined from 77, 898, thousand in 1999 to 72,919 in 2014. However, over the next two, uh, few decades, uh, de next decade, uh, thousands of new jobs will be created. So what's happening is a, a switch from manufacturing, working at the Chrysler plant kind of jobs, to uh, more technical and service workers. So the fastest job growth will occur uh, in the healthcare area, healthcare practitioners, techn technical occupations, healthcare support, and the lot. And a lot of these jobs only require two-year degrees, and their salary levels will compete with many jobs that require four-year degrees. So employment is projected to increase by 6.5% from 2014 to 2024, adding about 9.8 million jobs. The United States lost nearly 8.7 million jobs in the Great Recession and its aftermath, but it has gained 18.9 million jobs since then. So I think uh, you can, it, the, this next two slides will show you how the labor market has changed. This is the old Chrysler plant, which closed in 2010. It's right down the road uh, on South College. Uh, across from the uh, uh, stadium. It, in its place, though, uh, is the health science complex. Uh, star, we call it the Star Campus. And if you go in there, you'll see all kinds of uh, prosthetics and scientific uh, things being done. These will be the new middle class jobs uh, for the 21st century and there will be a lot of them. So uh, I won't go too deep and take too deep a dive into this uh, labor, federal labor standard, labor, the Federal Labor Bureau of Labor data, but the point is that over the next 10 years, only manufacturing, farming, and forestry uh, occupations will decline. So uh, one other thing, though, is that in the next three to five years, many salaried and professional occupations will require at least a bachelor's degree. And skilled laborers, such as technicians, mechanics, and foremen, will need to have specific post-secondary certificate or training, special training to qualify for future jobs. So the takeaway from all this is that many new jobs will be produced over the uh, next decade, especially in the service sectors. Uh, so the widespread belief that the good middle class jobs move to Mexico or Asia uh, is simply uh, not accurate. So this to me is very much like the Industrial Revolution of the late 19th and early 20th century, when people move from farms into urban communities to work in factories, and there was a dramatic transformation uh, of, of, of the, the workforce and what people did. Uh, so, uh, so people will need the K through 12 model, or 12 is not enough. You're gonna need K through 14. Uh, and what states should do, and what the investment should be, is in two-year associate degrees so that that will provide the specialized training that workers will need, and, uh, and hopefully at a relatively low cost compared to four-year institutions. So the jobs will be there, and there will actually be some jobs you can have uh, with a high school diploma, but uh, they will be in things like home health aides and food service workers, and it won't be, the, the compensation won't be, won't be that great, so the, the outlook the outlook actually is good. We just have to go through this transformation and the Rust Belt along the Great Lakes, and 
the factory cities in the Midwest and Erie and places like that, there will need to be a transformation. But that, I'm confident, like the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, this transformation will occur as well, and it will occur pretty quickly. So thank you so much. Oh, that's great. Um, we're going to do discussing comments and Q&A at the end, so we'll just move to the next presentation. Heather Geetha Taylor from the University of Kansas. Thank you. So I'll start my timer. I don't want the shark. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi. I just want to start by saying thank you so much to Dan, Maria, everyone else here at the University of Delaware and the Biden Institute for the opportunity to be here. Uh, thanks also to Vice President Biden for issuing this challenge. I am very proud to be a fellow graduate of Syracuse University, and uh, we share that uh, survivorship of upstate New York winners. So, <laughs> uh, but I want to thank all of you for the opportunity to be here today and to share with you some thoughts that I've had about the connection between public employment and the health of the middle class. And I really want to focus my comments today on what I see as an emerging new hollow state. So the idea of a hollow state really emerged following the new public management reforms of the 1990s, which were intended to provide cost savings, efficiencies, and this was accomplished primarily through streamlining the federal civil service and privatizing public services. Of course, what happened in the aftermath of that were some significant workforce management challenges. And we've seen some similar forces taking place at the state and local level. As you know, in the midst of very harsh fiscal realities following the Great Recession, uh, state and local governments also cut their workforces in, in some very dramatic ways. And those cuts have had some long lasting impacts on uh, public services and the communities they serve, from fire and police to public health and education. These trends matter, they should matter to us, because public employment has long been described as a pathway to the middle class. Public workers comprise approximately 16% of the total workforce. And workforce reductions that have been made in response to some short-term economic realities have actually threatened the long-term viability of public service and, of course, those that they serve in their communities. I want to focus on three components of what I see as a new hollow state today. The first is the context for public work. The second are the shifting expectations of the bureaucratic compact. And the third, uh, this is the decreased capacity that we have for managing our public workforce. I think that together these three themes present a lot of concerns, but they also present opportunities for revitalization. That's what I'd like to focus on today. So first, I would like to speak to the context of public employment. And as you can see from this graph, this is from the Gallup organization. And the first element I see of a new hollow state is the, actually this illustration, that Americans have long perceived big government to be the biggest threat facing our nation. But as you can see from this graph, that gap has widened significantly in recent years. And this demonstrates what some people describe as amnesia regarding the, the role that government plays in providing essential public services, infrastructure, and also contributing to our shared societal prosperity. One expression of this view is the effort to reduce or constrain the size of the public workforce. Yet we know that service demands and population growth have not stopped. So in order to meet these needs, the shadow or the contract workforce has continued to grow basically unabated and by some estimates outpaces the federal workforce by an estimate of two to one. Arguments for privatization of, uh, privatization's cost savings are not consistently supported by evidence. And concerns regarding contractor performance, shortfalls, and accountability concerns often fall on deaf ears. These trends impact middle-class Americans. The growth of the shadow workforce subverts a key characteristic of public employment. That is, public jobs are public goods. And they should be open to all qualified applicants. Public sector jobs have traditionally provided ladders of opportunity to the middle class, especially for minorities, given the sector's commitment to non-discrimination and representative bureaucracy. 
However, studies have shown that post-recession job cuts have had an especially detrimental effect on diversity. I would ask you, as we hollow out these jobs, are we also hollowing out our commitments to values such as equal employment opportunity? The second element that I'd like to focus on today and another indicator of concern is the hollowing out of the bureaucratic compact or the agreement that government has with its workers. Our contemporary bureaucratic compact emerged in the wake of the assassination of President Garfield in 1881 by disappointed office seeker Charles Guiteau. That violent event starkly demonstrated the corruption of the patronage or the spoil system by which we used to staff the bureaucracy primarily on political loyalty and affiliation. The subsequent Pendleton Act of 1883 paved the way for a stable and professional administrative state by ensuring open and competitive access to jobs, protection from undue political influence, and relative security of tenure. Today, these merit principles are under attack, especially via reforms such as those that promote at-will employment, which vacates our commitment to stability and due process for public workers. Further, as was discussed by Vice President Biden, as middle class salaries struggle to keep pace with increased cost of living, the issue of fair compensation is relevant. Public pay and benefits have long been under fire, but especially most recently as explanations for why state and local governments had revenue shortfalls following the recession. Studies, however, have shown that link to be unfounded, yet this premise has had lasting effects. At the federal level, for instance, Federal employee wages have stagnated since 2011, and you may have heard recently that some of the promised increases for federal workers have since been canceled. These issues challenge our ability to recruit and retain the best workers for public service. Also, another modern element of our bureaucratic compact is the right for public workers to unionize. This has also been under, a fire, under fire and also cited as one of the reasons for post-recession difficulties. However, this is a middle class issue and it is also a political issue. As you can see from this graph, there's a connection between unionization rates and the middle class aggregate share of, of income. Unions exist and they benefit the broader community. They also help build middle class wealth. Of course, unionization is a political issue. And this explains, uh, in part, why some um, some efforts have been undertaken to limit unionization because union members tend to be more politically active. The final element of the new hollow state that I want to focus on is the, la the loss of workforce management capacity and the associated burden shifting from employer to employee. This trend has some clear implications for middle class workers who are already navigating what some call a precarious condition of instability and uncertainty in the workplace. For example, while technology promises many efficiency saving um, opportunities, it is not without trade offs. Telework, for instance, is a way for the public sector to cut its workforce cuts, costs, excuse me, but it is often simply a cost shifting exercise. Further, it may hollow out important worker citizen interface, as well as the important developmental opportunities that exist in the workplace for coaching and mentoring. Also, our public sector capacity to manage our workforce is also being hollowed out. The new public manager, man, excuse me, management reforms targeted HR workers and reduced that workforce by 20% in less than 10 years. Contracting out of HR services continues to erode the quality and capacity of human resource management. As you can see from this illustration, the Office of Personnel Management exper experienced the greatest number of resignations among federal agencies from 2004 to 2012. This reduced capacity means that workers are increasingly their own HR managers, tasked with managing their performance and also demonstrating ever-increasing employee engagement despite insufficient supporting resources or direction. I have a number of recommendations that I hope will address these issues. Uh, in terms of context, we need champions for public service, and I hope you will join me in taking a positive stance, answering attacks on bureaucracy, which has for too long been an easy target. We need to invest in public employment. We need to push for transparency on the true costs of contracting decisions. We also need to make merit meaningful again, provide fair and competitive compensation, and support the right to unionize. We need to invest in public human resource management. 
Our contemporary societal challenges demand competent and consistent government responses. For goals such as regulating clean air and water, providing for an educated populace, or public health and safety, the contributions of public service and public servants cannot be overlooked. Attacks on public employees are attacks on the ability of government to carry out its most basic and important tasks. The health of the public workforce and the health of the middle class are linked. It has been said, in fact, that the decimation of the public sector is one of the unheralded reasons for the middle class shrink. Given these indicators of a new hollow state, I will conclude by noting an argument against the administrative state is an argument against the middle class, and it undermines the capacity and the potential of both. Thank you. Okay, uh, we'll keep in the order of the program. So Vanessa Fry, Boise State. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, so nice to be back in Delaware. I've vacationed here all my life, even though now I live in Idaho and I grew up in Ohio, um, down at Rehoboth Beach. So I feel like I'm, this is kind of like a second homecoming every time I come back here. So thanks for having me here today. Um, what I'm presenting on is based on my research ex and experience in the field of pay for success financing. And um, the research that I'm, I won't get into my detailed methodology, but it's been through elite interviews, content analysis, participant observation, and then uh, paid for contracts uh, doing assessments and evaluation of pay for success projects. And um, I really wanted to share with you what drives all my work in academia and in application. And that is, um, as we know, with privilege comes great responsibility. And those of us that are sitting in the room today, um, those of us that may be elected officials, those of us that are working with the next generation of leaders, we need to make sure the institutions that we put in place for public policy in this country do not harm people or the planet. And we need to make sure that while we're doing that, we keep the economy in mind. And so um, this is what drives uh, the work I do every day. And my kids, they help too. So, um, so what's going on in the US today? So I'm going to focus mostly on um, social programs in the US and connect it with pay for success financing. And, um, and really, this, uh, the topic when I pitched it, it was really about innovation, because pay for success is an innovative new financing mechanism. And then, um, and then I was put into the budgeting session, which is great, because what it really does is it helps us think about the way we use our public resources differently. So case in point, on an annual basis, we spend about $630 billion on means-tested welfare programs in this country, this is federal funds. Yet, since the 1970s, we haven't seen much um, increase in achievement in a number of categories in K through 12 education attainment. The poverty rate has essentially remained stagnant, and the annual income of the lower 40% in the US has also remained at a stagnant level. So what's going on here? You know, why is this happening? And this is why I believe it's happening. We have, as a public sector, made an underinvestment in a number of categories. One is in prevention-related programming. The other is in evidence-based programming. We also have lacked to put our policies in place in a way that focuses on outcomes rather than outputs. And finally, we put policies in place, but we don't robustly evaluate them. We have a desire of what we want them to achieve, but how often are we actually go in, going in and, and really looking into these programs? And there's a number of reasons why I think this is a case. Um, two in point, it's financially risky to try something new. And it's politically risky to put a program in place and then say it's not doing what you thought it would do, right? But people aren't sitting still. There's a number of actors across the sectors that are thinking up innovative new things. And one um, came out in the United States in 2012, and that's pay for success financing. And essentially what it does, it allows the public sector to partner with private and philanthropic investors to utilize capital to deploy to evidence-based interventions to help address social or environmental issues facing society today. Um, these actors can come within government or, or outside of government, and as John Kingdom called them, they're really policy entrepreneurs. They're passionate about the policy they want to address. They want to see social improvement. They want to make sure that our environment is well taken care of. Pay for success has become a tool for them to utilize to deploy resources to make a difference. 
I'm going to um, explain a little bit of the mechanics of this fairly complex financing arrangement. Essentially, what happens is a government's going to, and I'm going to talk it, about it in like a social, um, social intervention way. So government is going to realize there's some sort of big social issue their community is facing. So let's say it's issues regarding housing and homelessness. And then they'll find an evidence-based intervention. And in that sector, it could be housing first, for example. And then what they do in regards to pay for success is they'll evaluate the jurisdiction's opportunity to use that financing mechanism in their community. So they'll do a feasibility assessment. If it's indeed feasible, and it looks like the shifting resources to upstream interventions is indeed going to be more outcome oriented and achieve the results they want, then they're able to go out to the market and partner with philanthropic or private sector investors to get that chunk of upfront capital they need to really start a new program. So this can also be used in early childhood education. So in the state of Idaho right now, we do not provide pre-kindergarten for anyone. It's not something we do. And so there is a test that we have in the city of Boise, and that's deploying uh, resources, actually, from um, the help of United Way to help um, put two pre-K programs in place. And so it's really hard for the school district to come with that capital. And so what they did is they went to philanthropic investors, and they were able to partner with them. Those investors then provide the capital to a service provider. Um, in the case of the, the pre-K program, it's high uh, quality educators in the public school system. And they're providing an intervention to, to students that might otherwise fall behind in school. And so we also target the funding towards a, a population of people that we know have a need and that the evidence-based program has proven to, to help meet that, that need. Um, in this case, it'd be educational attainment with the pre-K program. So the program's in place, and then an external evaluator robustly evaluates the program and policy to make sure it's working. Um, what I've seen in pay for success programs is not only does it allow um, some kind of political cover to shift the program if it's not working, um, it allows them to stop the program if, if it's not working, right? It's really important. If we're not doing something right, why do we keep doing it? We do it all the time. Um, so if that program is successful, so in the pre-K program, if those students are achieving benchmark reading at a certain level that has been predetermined, then the investors are paid back their principal and interest, right? So this is the pay for success component of it. If it's not successful, they're not paid back, thereby reducing the, the financial risk on the, on the community. So this is complex, right? It's a complex system. This is kind of um, the shell of it. Usually there's an outside intermediary that helps kind of bring this all together. This is a, it's a really uh, unique partnership. The very first program in the US was launched in 2012 in uh, New York uh, under Mayor Bloomberg, and it was to prevent uh, recidivism, uh, reduce recidivism rates in the criminal justice system. Um, the, the idea was to provide an evidence-based intervention to uh, youth and that there'd be a 10% reduction in recidivism. Um, unfortunately, this particular program failed because the evidence-based intervention was evidence-based on um, the intervention being given to adults and not youth, right? And so we learned from that and they stopped the program. Despite that, we've seen pay for success spread across the US to address all kinds of social issues from recidivism to homelessness to asthma to educational achievement and to workforce development. So um, in the way of workforce development, there's a program right now in place in the Boston area that focuses on 2,500 adult learners. It's a little bit over of a $12 million investment. And the outcome that these participants are receiving are employment. And so they get um, education based on language barriers they may have. They get help with their resumes. And they get help with job interviews. And they're placing people out in the community and in the workforce. It's also been used for families to reunite. And this is in Cuyahoga County, um, Ohio, which is where Cleveland is. It focused on 135 families, about a $4 million investment. And what it's focusing on are families with youth that have gotten into the foster care system because of issues their parents have experienced. The program puts an intervention in place to provide housing and social support so the families can be reunited and stay together permanently. So there's a number of um, issues with this complex system of pay for success. But the thing that I think is most interesting about it is the way that it helps us rethink the way that we're using our public resources. If we can move our resources to be more preventative and upstream, then we're not going to be spending as much money downstream. Right? It's going to be more effective, and it's going to be more efficient. 
And so um, this was really launched and spurred by the Obama administration in 2009. They put a program in place that provided some funding, uh, the Social Innovation Fund. And at the time, um, First Lady Michelle Obama was saying, if we do this, if we really put our money towards evidence-based, outcome-oriented programs, we're going to have higher faith in government. And I feel like Pay for Success does that. It's effective, it's accountable, and it will gain the public trust. Thank you. Great. Uh, final speaker, Stephanie Hoops uh, from the United Way Alice Project. Great. I'm trying to pull up the slides. Yeah. Here we go. Great. Uh, well, thank you. Um, it is such a treat for me to be here in Delaware. I work on this project across the country, and I live in Wilmington, so this is my shortest commute. Uh, <laughs> And it's, it's great that, that we can be talking about this uh, here. So um, the United Way Alice Project is, um, I feel so well suited to this Biden challenge. And I appreciate Joe saying this morning, challenge orthodoxy. And in a way, that, that's what we're doing here. Um, so we have this juxtaposition between 70% of Americans identify with the middle class and yet we have a reality on the ground where 70% of Americans are not able to work hard, support their families, send their kids to, to a good school, save for retirement, do all those things that you feel are promised, are part of that promise. Um, so we have um, some specific measures that, that we feel help show this better. But I think, in, in general, it's important to step back and say, you know, we have a changing economy, a changing society here, and our old measures are not fully able to capture what's going on on the ground. So uh, one would be the outdated federal poverty level. Um, and then, you know, the other real reason that we see public policy failing, and, and um, Vanessa pointed out some, some good reasons, but just in a, in a broader picture, the focus has been just on making poverty a little less bad. It hasn't been on solving po poverty. It hasn't been on bringing people to financial stability. And so if our goal today is to think big and to you know, really rise to this challenge, you know, it's going to take reevaluating just the general focus of so much policy. Um, so I'm going to dig into to those things and then uh, have a few policy recommendations focused in the budget area um, that the panel's focused on. But I really want to throw out that bigger challenge as, as part of the, the whole day here. Um, so we, we have a, a big gap between what the federal poverty level shows uh, in this graph you can see. Um, it's about $24,000 for a family of four. and then. In, in the ALICE project, we measure what it actually costs to live and work uh, at a very basic level um, in the modern economy. And it differs not only by state, but by county. So in Randolph County, Indiana, that costs about $48,000 for a family of four. And then in Manhattan, it costs about $73,000 for a family of four. So we have big differences in what it actually costs on the ground, whereas our, our federal government is looking at it, uh, one static number across the whole country. Uh, the graph on the, on the right also shows the difference just in two of the, house, of the budget items, housing and child care, are very different place to place. So on the one hand, you have the cost of living. On the other hand, you have what wages pay. And here's the real uh, challenge that, that we have in our economy today. You add up just the bare minimum of housing, child care, food, transportation, health care, taxes, Alice pays taxes. Um, and that cost of that is a lot more than what kind of the average uh, top occupations in the country pay. Uh, so this is an example from New Jersey. And you measure that budget versus retail sales, child care, nursing assistant, security guard. None of those occupations can support that budget. Um, so one view of the US is uh, this is if you look at um, the federal poverty level. 
the darker the orange, the more people, uh, the higher the percentage of people are earning below that federal poverty level. So it's about 14% nationwide. You can see it's very different uh, by county across the country. You look at the Alice threshold, how many people can't afford that basic household survival budget, look how much darker that map gets. So instead of 14% of people uh, struggling, we have another 29%. So a total of 43% of households in the US are not, are not able to make ends meet. So we have a, a completely different magnitude of problem if we measure it in, in a way that actually captures those costs on the ground. Um, so that is a big challenge. That is, is not what our, our official statistics are telling us. And yet, it's a very simple math equation that we can all uh, figure out. Um, and if our policy is, is going to be better, if we're going to be able to, to enable those Alice households to be middle class, we're going to need to do things differently. So a few things in, in particular um, when we think about budgeting uh, where policy falls short. So there isn't really enough assistance to bring, uh, public assistance to bring families to financial stability. Uh, the orange are three public policy uh, programs, TANF, SSI, and SNAP. And you see the number receiving those benefits compared to the number of poverty in Alice households. It's not even close. Um, Many Alice households are not even eligible for assistance that the, if the threshold is the federal poverty level. Um, in many places it's multiples of the federal poverty level because people recognize it's woefully short. Um, but still, uh, the, many of the Alice households uh, above that threshold aren't eligible for any assistance. Uh, we have a problem with the cliff effect. Um, sometimes that, that you, you uh, are eligible, and then suddenly you're not eligible, and causing big gaps for families. Um, and then ultimately, benefits are very prescriptive. Uh, they don't adapt to a household specific needs. And in our changing society, we have many different kinds of households, different combinations of children, roommates, older children living back with their family, uh, uh, older siblings living together all kinds of combinations that public policy today doesn't fully recognize. So in thinking about budget priorities for the middle class, um, you know, these, the, the, the economic importance is not new uh, to, to the Alice Project or even to this conference. Uh, remember back to uh, Franklin Roosevelt uh, offered the Economic Bill of Rights in 1944. So we have a long history of thinking about this idea, but more excitingly, uh, the legislature in Hawaii just passed a resolution in 2017 that says, all families in Hawaii deserve basic financial security and that it is in the public interest to ensure economic sustainability for our people. So this, these ideas are coming back around and is, is this a um, obligation of, of government? Is this a right of people? You know, there's some big questions that are raised by the, the, the gap that we're all seeing. Um, we suggest um, some, some areas of public policy that, that can make a difference, and some of them have been addressed today, so I'll see how much time I have to get into them. Um, but one, ensure the value of work. Um, the second is address the widening skills gap. Third, provide meaningful cushion for instability. And last, facilitate savings and access to credit. So in terms of the first, I think that we've um, had a, 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 some interesting discussion on this already. Uh, the importance of, of work is, is also dignity and respect and your, your self-esteem. Uh, so with our changing economy, we have this huge move towards not only automation, but incorporation of technology and shifting of the way a lot of work is done. So many more people are working on demand, contract, um, uh, uh, um, starting their own one-person businesses. Uh, so we have all kinds of, of hours, work combinations that make it harder to get that smooth schedule, that um, income that's on a regular basis, um, and then 
to get wages that actually can pay the bills that, that we saw earlier. Um, we have a widening skills gap that Leyland uh, talked about. And with those, you know, the increasing role of technology, some jobs are being replaced, but some jobs are just requiring more technology. And those are jobs where people are already working. You can't go back to kindergarten to be learning these things that, that our education system needs to recognize <coughs> lifelong learning. Um, and as Leland pointed out, a lot of these jobs don't require advanced degrees. They just require new skills and new technological um, uh, understanding. So we need to think of a way that can deliver that um, in, in a more efficient uh, manner. One of the biggest uh, concerns I have going forward is this volatility of income. That as people work um, one week when, when the store is busy and the next week they don't work hours because the store is not busy, their rent still stays the same. So we have a challenge of how do, how do workers um, make it through those, those periods of, of less, less income. Um, and so some, uh, a lot of ideas have been uh, discussed in this area, and I hope that we can talk more about that today. But um, portable benefits, minimum guaranteed income, and um, some kinds of uh, job sharing in, in companies ensuring some employment. And then the last is facilitating savings and access to credit. So I uh, used up all my time, but I hope I've uh, helped encourage you all to talk more about these things going forward. Thank you. OK, we had some slack in there since everybody actually took 10 minutes. Um, uh, the discussant uh, is Phil Joyce from the University of Maryland. I'll, commit the error of letting him know he has more time than we told him. But <laughs> the, other, the, it down. the other thing is um, oh, if you st still keep it short, then we have time for Q&A. So uh, oh, yeah, no, I don't, I don't, I don't. Um, please, Phil. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, I, I was really looking forward to hearing your daughter sing. Uh, uh, but I, but I can I guess, still pull it up if we I guess have I'll, to. Have to, I'll right. have to wait for that. Right. Um, so uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, having been invited, and uh, I uh, really uh, applaud everyone who did uh, what was necessary in order to uh, pull this off. I think it's a very, uh, it's a very impressive gathering and a very impressive uh, set of people that you have here today, myself excluded. Um, so uh, I enjoyed uh, reading these papers, uh, and I would uh, I would commend the papers to you. Uh, you know, really. We just sort of scratched the surface in uh, in the ten minutes uh, or less that each of the uh, the presenters had. Uh, what I'm going to do is is just make a couple of comments on each of the papers, uh, and then I have uh, just a, a couple or three summary observations. I will say, since this is a, a budgeting panel, that I have to admit that. Uh, my comments are influenced by having spent 40 years as a budgeting practitioner and a you know teacher of budgeting and a scholar of budgeting. So you know I think about uh, scarce resources and trade-offs in my sleep, and so I may uh, some of that may sort of come across in what I say today. Uh, first, on, on Leland's paper, uh, I thought it was a really important observation. Uh, that technology is uh, more of a contributor than offshoring to the loss of middle class jobs. I, I don't think that's the sort of common uh, notion that people have. I think the notion people have is that you know, all of these jobs that have disappeared have gone to Mexico or Asia, and uh, to the extent that that's not true, that's really important. And I think the prescription, which is uh, the need to anticipate what sectors might demand workers without four-year college degrees, and the notion, which was also raised by uh, Stephanie and Dan, uh, that we should be training for those occupations, anticipating and training for those occupations, I think that's highly constructive. Uh, and the emphasis on training rather than suggesting that everyone should go to a four-year college, I think the no notion that some people you know, can get what they need uh, through either uh, vocational training or, or two-year associate's degrees seems appropriate. Uh, 
I wanted to go from there to just say a couple things about Stephanie and Dan's paper. I, I thought it was a fascinating documentation, this project of the gaps between what's needed for middle class families to live and what we have officially designated as the poverty level. And this really is thinking big, but because it's thinking so big and because the, the gap between current policy and what they identified as, as a sort of minimum income that would be necessary in order for these families to get by is so large and government resources are so scarce, and I'll talk more about that later, uh, I think it, it then creates a demand for us to think about which of these might be the highest priority, which of these uh, interventions that she talks about might be the highest priority, and also which in a given context are the most politically feasible. Uh, Vanessa's paper on pay for success uh, interested me as someone who spent a lot of time studying something called performance budgeting, which means many different things to many different people. Uh, but part of the reason I applaud this effort is because many times there is uh, little connection that is made between cost and performance. Uh, that is, you have people in budget offices, and I used to work in budget offices, and all they think about is how much money something's going to cost, and then you have people who are focused on performance, and they focus on performance without actually asking the question, how much is, is it going to cost? And I think that we should not have the notion that performance should be pursued at any cost. We should also not have the notion that just because something costs money, we shouldn't do it. Um, and uh, it does suggest, however, if you're going to have pay for success, that you need to have the right measures of success. Uh, and that's often itself challenging. We've seen all kinds of efforts where uh, people do focus on performance, but there's disagreement about whether they have the right measures of performance or not. One thing that uh, Vanessa didn't talk about but was in her paper uh, is that uh, interventions often that have long-term benefits are likely to run up against short-term thinking and that both our political process and our budget process tend to uh, emphasize the short term over the long term. I had a colleague who uh, worked for the Congress for uh, a lot of years, and so he came to this view uh, quite, uh, you know, quite uh, by experience. And uh, he said to me once, members of Congress are people just like you and me, but they have very high discount rates. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, so we have to we have to think about the political process that we're in, and e and either we you know have to sort of focus on delivering uh, some results that will happen in the short term and the long term, or we have to think about how to bring more long term thinking uh, into the process. And then uh, finally, Heather's paper on revitalizing the public services uh, focuses on on what I think uh, we should all view to be an alarming problem which is the decline uh, of support from the public and elected officials for the public service. So I think focusing on an appreciation of public service, a rejection of the notion that the private sector always does things better, or something that I've been asked to talk about a lot for some reason in the last couple years, which is the notion that operating government like a business is the solution to whatever it is that ails government. Uh, I think these are both things that need to be confronted di directly and, and challenged, and it does not mean that uh, there aren't any, there's anything that government can learn from business, but just because someone has arguably been successful in business does not mean they would be successful in government. Uh, I thought the notion <coughs> that merit needs to be more meaningful had a lot of, well, merit. Uh, and I, I did think about uh, a couple of the recommendations and sort of how they fit together. Uh, one of them was making merit meaningful, and the other was strengthening unions. I certainly agree with making merit uh, meaningful. I think we do need to think about, those of us who care about public service, that in addition to rewarding employees who perform well and doing a better job of that than we do now, we also need, government needs to be able to shed workers who do not perform. And there are times when uh, public employee unions are an impediment to the latter. And I don't think that does any good in terms of uh, enhancing the uh, support that the public might have for the public sector. So just a couple of final comments, which I think are connected. Uh, and again, I go back to, you know, I spend a lot of time thinking about budgeting. Making good on a lot of these promises implies spending a lot of money. 
uh, and leaving aside state and local governments who have their own problems, uh, the federal deficit is projected to, again, reach $1 trillion by the end of the current fiscal year. Federal debt has doubled as a percentage of GDP in the last 10 years. This level of debt actually itself is not good for the middle class. Uh, it can contribute to higher interest rates, and it uh, increasingly robs us of our ability to invest in the kinds of good ideas that we're talking about today. Um, I will say, uh, and I say this as a budget analyst uh, more than having it be a partisan comment, I don't think we needed a tax cut. Uh, and I certainly don't think we needed a tax cut where all the benefits or many of the benefits were skewed toward the top 10%. But we are where we are. Uh, and unless we're going to convince elected officials that they should raise taxes, which is often a difficult thing to do, I think sort of picking up on Vanessa's point on the pay for success idea, I think we have to think about what kinds of things we can do that involve leveraging societal resources. That is, leveraging resources in the private sector and the nonprofit sector in order to solve uh, some of these problems, as opposed to uh, assuming that all of these problems can be dealt with by creating large government uh, programs. Uh, I think if we do that, then we may be able, certainly in the short run and maybe even the longer run, to, uh, to make more progress. So I will thank you again and stop there. OK, uh, we are going to move to a more participatory uh, aspect. But before we do that, we do have some time for a little traditional Q&A. If anybody has uh, a burning question for any of the panelists, uh, yes, Professor Millward, please. Uh, Brent Millward, University of Arizona. Really wonderful panel. And uh, the question I have and the question I came here with is it's wonderful to hear all kinds of policies that if we can find some way to make them politically feasible, if we can find some way to make them affordable by leveraging the, the, the nonprofit or the private sector, that's great. But what are the politics that make this possible? I don't see any of this being possible without changing our politics. And I guess I'd, that's the question I'd like to throw out for the panel. Please. I'm happy to take that on. It's not something I really dug into um, in my talk. I talked about a, a little bit in my paper. But one of the things I really like about the pay for success model is because I, I found it to be very nonpartisan and allows us to have nonpartisan conversations because we're talking about fiscal responsibility. But we're also talking about helping like social and environmental systems and um, by being fiscally responsible. And so, um, I've seen it as far as like the political makeup of supporters that have gotten behind it. There's, it's not just a bunch of Democrats or a bunch of Republicans. We're really seeing both parties come together. You see um, the governor of Utah supporting it. You see Cory Booker supporting it, right? And part of it is the concept of um, let's rethink of the way we're doing our budgeting. It's not about just raising taxes, right? If we keep on raising taxes and we keep on putting more money towards programs, we're still in the same place we've been, right, since the 1970s, like I said. So let's rethink the way we're doing it. And, how, and I think the, the, what Phil was saying is, how do we do it with elected officials that are on two-year, six-year, four-year cycles, right? How do we show that the policies they're putting in place are effective enough to allow them to, um, to stay in government? Because they're rational-minded, right? They want to get reelected. But um, that's the really tricky part. So I think it's, how can we show the, the short-term um, outcomes are being met? but um, not risking any of the long-term outcomes. Yeah, please. So I, I think you're really on to something, and, and <laughs> we all know that there's some real political issues in, in the country right now. One of the things that we found with, with Alice is there's a, the, the mismatch between you know, what people feel has been promised with the American dream and working hard and, and not making it. So you know, this, this unbelievable frustration, and I think that's what came out in the last election, but what we saw is it came out, some supported Donald Trump, some supported Bernie Sanders. So the person who can um, combine, you know, that, that can put that wave together and get those supporters from, from those two extremes into, you know, one set of solutions and a way forward, I think, is the way our politics can, can move forward in a huge way, solve the problem, pull some, provide some, um, common ground uh, for, for the country that's feeling so divisive right now. 
Well, I'll comment also. The attack on public service came with Ronald Reagan when he said government is the problem. And that rhetoric has continued to go and it's, you know, cut taxes. Uh, and so, and, and by the way, the other part of that is bringing in outside contractors was a scam to make money with the Beltway bandits that surround Washington. And so the services cost way more than they would have if people were working in the, in, the, in the agency. So somehow the government, I mean, the public needs to understand um, what's going on. But when you have so many, so much propaganda going on right now, it's kind of difficult for them to, they're feeling pain, but they don't know the actual cause of it. So I think uh, 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 the dialogue and the education process. And the other thing too is, or a related thing is uh, what, and elected officials are doing these days are they're pushing emotional buttons. And so when people get pushed, you know, the immigrants are taken over, uh, or the scare tactics, then, you know, they don't think. So uh, we really have a real disservice, a, a tremendous disservice, you know, and sort of the rhetoric that goes on and misleading people and making them angry and frightened. I would just echo those comments and, and, and add that I think we really need stronger voices in support of public service. To me, that should be a nonpartisan issue, support of public service, but it certainly has not been for a long time. Um, and of, of course, it's partly because of the rewards, the, the money. Um, you know, it's, it's shocking to me that half of the defense budget goes directly to contractors, and the CEO of Lockheed Martin makes 100 times what the Secretary of Defense makes. Uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's those kinds of issues. Um, but, but I do think that we have an opportunity to answer the attacks on bureaucracy. Some of it, I think, is framing. I think that when you ask people, generally, um, about their support for bureaucrats, right, that's probably a lot less than their support for their public servants. And so I think some of this is messaging, uh, and, and politicians have an opportunity to support um, our public servants in some new ways. I would add just one comment, which is that the odds of things working out politically at the state and local level are much higher than yeah. working yeah. out the federal. And we're seeing grassroots efforts, particularly with teachers, even in red states. Um, mm -hmm. So I've been a professor long enough to know that if I ask another question, we won't finish in one minute. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to, sorry, just end it there. Um, we're going to transition to an idea exchange. So at each table, there's a facilitator, and you're going to discuss three to four questions. And so the facilitators will gather uh, your feedback on various perspectives, either directly or indirectly related to the papers. They'll gather uh, all the feedback, and at the end of the day, we'll hear back some of the feedback. But the idea here is to be a non-traditional conference and really address the challenge by bringing ideas that are not just in papers, but also in the participants. So I'll just declare that we're going to start that uh, process now. Thank you, and thank you for our panelists, and thank you for discussing. I think it was a really good uh, first plenary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. Yeah.